your technology and, and your own expertise? Well, my experience, it, it, looking at it in itself, technology is not, it's a neutral matter, basically. Uh, I think, though, technology can be used both for good and bad, and in Vietnam, a lot of it was used in a very bad sense. We had everything from what we call button bombs, which were little bombs the size of a button, spread throughout the jungle. And these were dropped by American planes, and these would uh, not kill a person as much as maim a person, wound a person to such an extent that it would take three or four other people to uh, manpower to take care of that person. We had everything from that to one of the bombs that was used that I felt was very inhumane was what they called the flechette bomb. And the flechette bomb was a cluster bomb of plastic pellets. These plastic pellets would not show up on an x-ray. So these people that would be hit, children, women, uh, men, whatever, these people that would be hit with these plastic pellets would have no recourse. There, there was no medical knowledge that was able to take these pellets outside, out of their bodies. So a lot of these people suffered and died horrible deaths. These plastic pellets were actually far more expensive than metal that could be detected on an x-ray. So why would they use something like this unless it was to demoralize the whole people? Why would they use a technology that cost much more money when they could do just as an effective job with something that was less expensive? And I think psychologically, this had an impact on the Vietnamese people. That uh, they, this is the way that America uh, demoralized that whole uh, ethnic group of people. I also look back on it and feel that even though with all the technology that we had in Vietnam, that, would, that could not defeat the, the spirit of the Vietnamese people. That to me, that was a very important lesson that we, need, we needed to learn over there, that the spirit of the people, no matter how long it's going to take, will, will overcome the technology that's used against them. No. My experience, I was a medic over there. My job was to patch people up that got wounded. Uh, the other good aspect of technology, the one good aspect of technology over there, is the medical advances that we got through the war. Even though it was being done in a very destructive manner, we learned so much medically in the, in the technological medical field that even today, some of those lessons we, we learned, we, uh, learned about how to treat people in Vietnam have saved lives today back here. The technology that was, that was developed in Vietnam in the medical sense is now being used to a large extent in America, well, around the world, in various me medical uh, hospitals. So can you tell me something about the Agent Orange? Okay, Agent Orange was a defoliant that was uh, manufactured to get rid of shrubbery to, to see where your enemy was coming from. This was done in such an extent that there are now still existing today in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia areas that look like the face of the moon where nothing will grow, nothing can grow, nothing will grow for, for hundreds to thousands of years. It also got in the bloodstream or, or got into the water stream and the, and the food chain so that, that today, aside from the American veterans suffering, there are still people in Vietnam, babies being, befo being born deformed, uh, fetuses aborted very early, uh, that the land is still, the, the defoliant is still in the land, that it's ungrowable, this land is ungrowable that at one time Vietnam was one of the, the largest rice producing countries in, in the uh, Asian world and now a lot of its rice has to be exported because of the Agent Orange. You have to look at it also not only Agent Orange, you had Agent Purple, you had Agent White, you had a bunch of different herbicides and defoliants that was used. At the time that it was used, they, I felt that they knew but didn't let the, the people know that this could cause human uh, aside from defoliant or, or 
destroying the land, this also could cause physical damage in people. And I felt that they purposely knew that and used it anyway, without, without uh, considering the effects that it would have on, on a culture of people and Americans themselves. I think, uh, basically, by and large, I feel that the government did not care about the American soldiers over there, that we were cannon fodder, that we were used. You have to understand that most Americans that fought in Vietnam came from a lower middle class background, that we were the throwaway society, that a lot of the Americans were third world, poor white, and in a way, we were being used as experiments to, to uh, test out some of this technology, this war technology, that we, we didn't basically count. That it didn't matter to the American government what happened to their soldier that, that, that they sent over there. And that was also true when we came home, the reception that we got when we came back to the United States. We were still a throwaway society. People either looked at us as these mentally deranged, drug-crazed veterans that uh, first of all lost their war, and second of all, the people that they were supposed to relate to with the most, their own peer group, rejected them. And this had a, a great psychological impact on the veteran when they came home. Well. I joined the Navy in 1963. I had never heard of Vietnam. Uh, once I went into the Navy, I wanted to become a medic. Uh, I didn't recognize at that time that the Marine Corps didn't have their own medical field. So when I went into the Navy, went through Navy boot camp, basic training, then through, went through Navy Medical Corps school, and then got drafted into the Marine Corps, and went through five weeks of basic Marine Corps boot camp, and then medical field service school and they got attached to the Marine Corps. My first time in combat was not in Vietnam, was in the Dominican Republic when they sent the six Marines from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where I was stationed at the time, down to uh, a small, quote, shall we say, revolution in the Dominican Republic. I was only there for about a month and a half, but did see combat. I got out of the service, uh, started auditing, auditing some classes at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where I grew up. Attending bar across the street, met a woman who was a Quaker who eventually became my wife. And uh, when I got called, I got called back into the service. I'll never forget this. I got a telegram, July 4th, 1967, saying you have been reactivated. Report to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Your military obligation is six years. Even though I had been in for four years, had gotten out, they called me back in, which they have the legal right to do. By this time, I, I was uh, somewhat anti-war by the Quaker influence, uh, was not very active politically whatsoever, uh, was 24 when I got the telegram, felt that I had to go to Vietnam, felt it was my generation's war. There was a part of me that grew up in South Philadelphia where I grew up. Everybody went into the service. That was one of the ways we made it out of our ghettos. It was a stepping stone. And uh, I didn't say that I went over there to fight communism. I did go over there with a very strong Catholic belief that communism was wrong, growing up very strict Catholic. Uh, when I got to Vietnam, my thinking began to change very rapidly, as soon as I was over there, in fact. I refused to carry a weapon. Instead of a weapon, I carried in my holster that they issued with the 45. I left the 45 behind and carried battle dressings in my holster. Uh, I was older. I, I turned 25 in Vietnam. And for me, I not only had to be a medic, I also had to be a counselor to a lot of these guys. Uh, guys getting Dear John letters, guys committing atrocities, guys seeing their buddies get hurt. I had to do a lot of counseling with these people. Personally, I started withdrawing. 
saying, okay, I'm here, I've got a job to do, but I don't want to know these people. When guys got into my company, I didn't want to know where they were from. I didn't want to know anything about them because my way of survival was closing off my emotions. When I came back from Vietnam, being wounded there twice, being decorated for bravery, I still came back very much against the war. Uh, I had been back less than two weeks, went to the first anti-war march, large anti-war march here in San Francisco in October of 1968, had been back from Vietnam less than two weeks. I remember marching and getting up by the podium and hear the speakers all saying, kill her, kill her, kill her. That got to me. I was very much for peace. I could not join the peace movement in America. I started going to school, going back to college. Noticing at demonstrations, still going to demonstrations, but noticing at demonstrations a lot of guys that were a little bit older had a certain look about them and started talking with them and formed a group called Veterans for Peace, which eventually became a chapter of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I became a national organizer and then the national president of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. My way of dealing with that experience in Vietnam was be, being very political by organizing veterans. After a while though I noticed that coming to these meetings guys were coming drunk, guys were coming high, stoned, a lot of heroin, a lot of other various drugs that they were taking and I started withdrawing from political activity and started doing counseling although I remained very political, still going to demonstrations. I wasn't spending all of my time just doing political organizing. I started doing counseling with veterans. Uh, formed a group from Vietnam Vets Against the War. We formed a group called Twice Born Men, which we got from a, a, a Catholic priest here in America, the, the Father Barrican, that talked about when he was underground that people that go through the military system or people go through the prison system facing and working through their fears as being twice born. And that's what we felt we were, not with the religious connotation of the word, but that we went through a horrible experience. We took this experience, and instead of using our experience in destructive ways, we started using them in positive ways. At the same time, a lot of these guys that were doing this work were leading very self-destructive lives themselves. From there, I co-founded a group here in San Francisco called Swords to Plowshares, which is a veterans' rights organization. For the last 17 years, and then got hired by the veterans, I used to, t it was ironic, I was leading a uh, demonstration at the Veterans Hospital against Agent Orange and why the VA was not recognizing it and doing anything about it. And a week later, the Veterans Administration hired me as a consultant to set up a program nationwide to deal with the psychological readjustment problems with, of Vietnam veterans. I quit working there in 1984, working for the Veterans Administration because I felt it was lying to the veterans. I felt it became part of the bureaucracy that was uh, keeping these veterans down. The program worked very well for three years. The first three years we had it in existence. We had it set up in neighborhoods. We did not want this readjustment counseling going on in the VA hospitals because of the veterans' feelings about the Veterans Administration. So we had these neighborhood, what we, we called neighborhood centers, and it worked well. The problem was it was working so well, it was showing up the Veterans Administration. I knew the end was coming when I got a phone call, a national phone call, national conference phone call, when they were saying to us, play down the question of, vet, of Agent Orange. Don't talk to these guys about Agent Orange when they started saying to us, you can no longer go into the bars or the pool halls or the street corners where the vet these veterans hang out, that you can only work nine to five. I knew then that a program that I took a great deal of pride in in the beginning was becoming a bureaucratic nightmare because it was working so well. Uh, Yes. Can you explain me a little bit better? You have to understand that my generation was raised on the Second World War. 
that. I remember as a kid sitting around listening to my uncles, my father, talking about their experiences in the Second World War, that there was that feeling of patriotism that America had after the Second World War. Uh, watching John Wayne movies, watching all these movies on TV, combat, things like that, that part of my generation, especially if you were a male, you wanted to go into the service. You wanted to see your war. You wanted to prove yourself. Could I did, have done what, what my father had done? Was I a coward? I grew up with, with the only two feelings in South Philadelphia, basically, that I grew up with, that a man was allowed to show was either being horny or angry. Other feelings we were not allowed to develop. And I think that carried a lot of us to Vietnam, that we joined because of our wanting to see if we could do what our fathers did, our joining because of the whole political arena here at the time, that here was this country, and if we don't fight it there, it'll be here. So a lot of us joined, uh, raised, also raised very anti-communist. So the patriotism that we, we formed as children carried over, and we, we did join the service. A lot of us went to Vietnam believing in it. A lot of us came home very disillusioned, not believing in it. At the same time, though, I feel that we were very patriotic. The anger that a Vietnam veteran feels, the alienation that a lot of us felt, the frustration a lot of us felt, to me are signs of sanity, not insanity. How else can you come from that experience not feeling these things? The problem is you need a setting to help yourself work through these problems. I still have difficulties myself with, with uh, my experience in Vietnam. Sometimes it's easier for me to deal with my physical wounds that still disable me today than it is with the psychological wounds I felt that I got from that war. I uh, still have a nightmare when I get very stressed out. And what that nightmare is that I reach into my medic badge or my medic bag, and I pull out a battle dressing. And I, so I open this battle dressing, it turns into a body bag, and a body bag is where we put the dead people. And this comes back to me when I'm, I'm very stressed out. I don't think anybody, whether it's from Vietnam or any war, that really saw combat will ever forget it. I think the difference is that not only did the Vietnam veteran see more combat than his Second World War II counterpart, we actually did see more combat. We also faced combat when we came home. My father came back to a country that accepted him. He also came back by a, a troop ship where he had enough time to talk about his experiences, to work through some of these experiences. He also went into the service, trained as a unit, fought as a u unit, and returned as a unit unless he was wounded. My generation went to Vietnam as an individual, which had a psychological impact on you especially if you were assigned to a combat unit, because people would not accept you right away until you, quote, have proven yourself, because their survival depended on that. Most importantly, though, is the nature of the war itself. The technology of the weapons that we used were so, dis so destructive. The way that we were taught to treat the Vietnamese people as if they were not human. Then the most important thing, I think, is when we came back, 72 hours before, I was literally in combat in Vietnam. 72 hours later, I'm on the streets of San Francisco. And for me, what my survival instincts and my survival mechanisms were in Vietnam were definitely not the type of things you need in a, quote, civilized society back here. Uh, I had a very difficult problem readjusting to that, readjusting to American society. There was a part of me that felt I had all these dreams when I was in Vietnam of returning home and what, would, what I would receive. All these dreams turned out to be lies as the Vietnam War turned out to be a lie. Uh, I still have bitterness. I still have resentment. Not against the American people as much as against my government. I think my government wasted a lot of people for nothing. One of the things that angers me most is that three times the number of people that served in Vietnam have died 
since they were released to civilian life than were actually killed in combat. That angers me. The number of Vietnam veterans in prisons today angers me. Although I, I want to say not all of us, there are people that have made it back here. Made it, quote, meaning having a full-time job, working. A lot of us were able to go to school. I know that for me, uh, if it had not been for the service, I would have never gone to college. I'm the first one in my, my generation to go to university. And I think it was because of my Vietnam experience. Uh, I feel that the lessons we learned from Vietnam we've lost today. Uh, I think if you look at Grenada, if you look at Panama, we've not learned a thing. I think we're still based, this country's still based on greed, that our government's still based on greed. I think our country uses the technology that we had in Vietnam, and, and even though it may be not used back here, it is sold to third world countries. I think we are a uh, basic military industrial complex, and that's where the money in this country is made. And uh, I, feel I feel that the younger generation are somewhat apathetic, that they have not uh, applied themselves. I think there's a lot of things going on in this country that people should be involved in, problems like the homeless, or problems like working conditions. And I feel that uh, people want to go out and make a buck, and that's it. Right. Right. Uh, you, you already told me why. Okay. Uh, when 